Hey guys, today I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to try reading from one of my favorite books, Soft Spoken instead of Whisper. It's called The Wizard's First Rule. And I'll be reading the first chapter for you. Chapter 1 It was an odd-looking vine. Dusky, variegated leaves hunkered against a stem that wound in a stranglehold around the smooth trunk of a balsam fir. Sap drooled down the wounded bark, and dry limbs slumped, making it look as if the tree were trying to voice a moan into the cool, damp morning air. Pods stuck out from the vine here and there along its length, almost seeming to look warily about for witnesses. It was the smell that first had caught his attention. A smell like the decomposition of something that had been wally unsavory even in life. Richard combed his fingers through his thick hair as his mind lifted out of the fog of despair. Coming into focus upon seeing the vine, he scanned for others, but saw none. Everything else looked normal. The maples of the upper Venn forest were already tinged with the crimson, proudly showing off their new mantle in the light breeze. With nights getting colder, it wouldn't be long before their cousins down in the Heartland Woods joined them, the oaks being the last to surrender to the season, still stoically wore their dark green coats, having spent most of his life in the woods. Richard knew all, the plants if not by name by sight. From when Richard was very small, his friends Ed had taken him along, hunting for special herbs. He had shown Richard which ones to look for, where they grew and why, and put names to everything they saw. Many times they just talked the old man always treating him as an equal, asking as much as he answered. Zed had sparked Richard's hunger to learn, to know. The vine, though he had seen only once before, and not in the woods, he had found a sprig of it at his father's house, in the blue clay jar Richard had made when he was a boy. His father had been a trader and had traveled often, looking for the chance, exotic or rare item. People of means had often sought him out, interested in what he might have turned up. It seemed to be the looking more than the finding that he liked, as he had always been happy to part with his latest discovery so he could be off after the next. From a young age, Richard had always liked to spend time with Zed while his father was away. Richard's brother, Michael, was a few years older, and having no interest in the woods or in Zed's ramblings, rambling lectures, preferred to spend his time with people of means. About five years before, Richard had moved away to live on his own, but he often stopped by his father's home. Unlike Michael, who was always busy and rarely had time to visit. Whenever his father went away, he would leave Richard a message in the blue jar telling him the latest news, some gossip, or of some sight he had seen. On the day, three weeks before when Michael had come to tell him their father had been murdered, Richard had gone to his father's house, despite his brother's insistence that there was no reason to go, nothing he could do. Richard had long since passed the age when he did, as his brother said, 
wanting to spare him. The people there didn't let him see the body, but still, he saw the big, sickening splashes and puddles of blood, brown and dry across the plank floor. When Richard came close, voices fell silent, except to offer sympathy, which only deepened the writhing pain. Yet, he had heard them talking in hushed tones of the stories and the wild rumors of things come out of the boundary, of magic. Richard was shocked at the way his father's small home had been torn apart, as if a storm had been turned loose inside. Only a few things were left untouched. The blue message jar still sat on the shelf, and inside he found the sprig of vine. It was still in his pocket now. What his father meant him to know from it, he couldn't guess. Grief and depression overwhelmed him, and even though he still had his brother, he felt abandoned. That he was grown into manhood offered him no sanctuary from the forlorn feelings of being orphaned and alone in the world. A feeling he had known before, when his mother died. While he was still young, even though his father had often been away, sometimes for weeks, Richard had always known he was somewhere, and he would be back. Now he would never be back. Michael wouldn't let him have anything to do with the search for the killer. He said he had the best trackers in the army looking, and he wanted Richard to stay out of it for his own good. So Richard simply didn't show the vine to Michael and went off alone every day searching for it. For three weeks he walked the trails of the Heartland Woods, every trail, even the ones few others knew of, but he never saw it. Finally, against his better judgment, he gave in to the whispers in his mind and went to the upper Venn forest, close to the boundary. The whispers haunted him, with the feeling that the somehow he knew something of why his father had been murdered. They teased him, tantalized him, with thoughts just out of reach, and laughed at him for not seeing it. Richard lectured himself that he that it was his grief playing tricks, not something real. He had thought that when he found the vine, it would give him some sort of answer. Now that he had, he didn't know what to think. The whispers had stopped teasing him, but now they brooded. He knew it was just his own mind thinking, and he told himself to stop trying to give the whispers a life of their own said it taught him better than that. Richard looked up at the big fir tree in its agony of death. He thought again of his father's death. The vine had been there. Now the vine was killing this tree. It couldn't be anything good. Though he couldn't do anything for his father, he didn't have to let the vine preside over another death. Gripping it firmly, he pulled and with powerful muscles ripped the sinewy tendrils away from the tree. That's when the vine bit him. One of the pods struck out and hit the back of his left hand, causing him to jump back in pain and surprise. Inspecting the small wound, he found something like a thorn embedded into the meat of the gash. The matter was decided. The vine was trouble. He reached for his knife to dig out the thorn, but the knife wasn't there. At first surprised, he realized why and reprimanded himself for allowing this depression to cause him to forget something as basic as taking his knife with him into the woods. Using his fingernails, he tried to pull out the thorn. 
to his rising concern the thorn as if alive wriggled itself in deeper. He dragged his thumbnail across the wound, trying to snag the thorn. The more he dug, the deeper it went. A hot wave of nausea swept through him as he tore at the wound, making it bigger. So he stopped. The thorn had disappeared into the oozing blood. Looking about, Richard spotted the purplish-red autumn leaves of a small nannyberry tree. Laden with its crop of dark blueberries, beneath the tree nestled in the crook of a root, he found what he sought, an alm plant. Relieved, he carefully snapped off the tendril stem near its base and gently squeezed the sticky clear liquid in onto the bite. He smiled as he mentally thanked old Zed for teaching him how to how the alm plant made wounds heal faster. The soft fuzzy leaves always made Richard think of Zed. The juice of the alm numbed the sting, but not his worry over being unable to remove the thorn. He could feel it wriggling still deeper into his flesh. Richard squatted down and poked a hole in the ground with his finger, placed the alm in it, and fixed moss about the stem so it might regrow itself. The sounds of the forest fell dead still. Richard looked up, flinching as the dark shadow swept over the ground, leaping across limbs and leaves. There was a rushing, whistling sound in the air overhead. The size of the shadow was frightening. Birds burst from cover in the trees, giving alarm calls as they scattered in all directions. Richard peered up, searching through the gaps in the canopy of green gold, trying to see what the shadow source. For an instant, he saw something big, big and red. He couldn't imagine what it could be, but the memory of the rumors and stories of things coming out of the boundary flooded back into his mind, making him go cold to the bone. The vine was trouble, he thought again. This thing in the sky could be no less. He remembered what people always said. Trouble, sires, three children, and knew immediately that he didn't want to meet the third child. Discounting his fears, he started running. Just idle talk of superstitious people, he told himself. He tried to think of what could be that big, that big and red. It was impossible. There was nothing that flew that was that large. Maybe it was a cloud, or a trick of the light. He couldn't fool himself. It was no cloud. Looking up as he ran, trying to, trying for another glimpse, he headed for the path that skirted the hillside. Richard knew that the ground dropped off sharply on the other side of the trail, and he would be able to get an unobstructed view of the sky. Tree branches wet with the rain from the night before slapped his, slapped at his face as he ran through the forest. Jumping falling trees, jumping fallen trees and small rocky streams. Brush snatched at his pant legs. Dappled swatches of sunlight teased him to look up, but denied him the view he needed. His breath was fast, ragged. Sweat ran cold against his face, and he could feel his heart pounding as he ran carelessly down the hillside. At last he stumbled out of the trees onto the path, almost falling. Searching the sky, he spotted the thing. Far away, and too small for him to tell what it was, but he thought it had wings. He squinted. Against the blue brightness of the sky, shielded his eyes with his hand, trying to see for sure if there was if there were wings moving. It slipped behind a hill and was gone. He hadn't even been able to tell if it really was red. Winded, Richard slumped down on a granite boulder at the side of the trail, absently snapping off dead twigs from a sapling beside, while he stared down at Trunt Lake below. Maybe he should go tell Michael what had happened. Tell him about the vine and the red thing in the sky. He knew Michael would laugh at the last part. 
he had laughed at those same stories himself. No, Michael would only be angry with him for being up the boundary, being up near the boundary, and for going against his orders to stay out of the search for the murder. He knew his brother cared about him, or he wouldn't always be nagging him. Now that he was grown, he could laugh off his brother's constant instructions, though he still had to endure the looks of displeasure. Richard snapped off another twig and, in frustration, threw it at a flat rock. He decided he shouldn't feel singled out. After all, Michael was always telling everyone what to do, even their father. He pushed aside his harsh judgments of his brother today. It was brother. Today was a big day for Michael. Today... He was accepting the position of first counselor. He would be in charge of everything now, not just the town of Heartland anymore, but all the towns and villages of Westland, even the country people, responsible for everything and everyone. Michael deserved Richard's support. He needed it. Michael had lost a father, too. That afternoon, there was to be a ceremony and big celebration at Michael's house. Important people were going to be there, come from the farthest reaches of Westland. Richard was supposed to be there too. At least there would be plenty of good food, he realized as he was famished. While he sat and thought, he scanned the opposite side for Trent Lake, of Trent Lake far below. From this height, the clear water revealed alternating patches of rocky bottom and green weed around the deep holes. At the edge of the water, Hawker's Trail knitted in and out of the trees, and some places open to view and some places hidden. Richard had been on the, that part of the trail many times. In the spring, it was wet and soggy down by the lake, but this late in the year it would be dry. In areas farther north and south as the trail wound its way through the high bend forest. Excuse me. It passed comfortably close to the boundary. Because of that, most travelers avoided it, choosing to instead the trails take the trails of the Heartland Woods. Richard was a woods guide and led travelers safely through Heartland Forest. Most were traveling dignitaries wanting the prestige of a local guide more than they wanted a direction. His eyes locked on something. There was movement, unsure what it had been. He stared hard at the spot on the far side of the lake. When he saw it again on the path, where it had passed behind a thin veil of trees, there was no doubt. It was a person. Maybe it was his friend Chase. Who else but a boundary warden would be wandering around up here? He hopped down off the rock, tossing the twigs aside, and took a few steps forward. The figure followed the path into the open at the edge of the lake. It wasn't Chase. It was a woman. A woman in a dress. What woman would be walking around this far out in the Ven Forest in a dress? Richard watched her making her way along the lake shore, disappearing and reappearing with the path. She didn't seem to be in a hurry, but she wasn't strolling slowly either. Rather, she moved at the measured pace of an experienced traveler. That made sense. No one lived anywhere near Trunt Lake. Other movements snatched at his attention. Richard's eyes searched the shade and shadows behind her. There were, th there were others, three, no four men in hooded forest cloaks following her. But hanging back some distance, they moved with stealth from tree to rock to tree, looking, waiting, moving. Richard straightened, his eyes wide, his attention riveted. They were stalking her. He knew immediately this was the third child of trouble. That 
was the end of chapter one. If you guys like this, let me know, and I'll do more.